Um, hi all, I'm Dr. Shobhna. I'm a neonatologist and I'm here to speak about essential newborn care because there are so much of uh, queries and doubts that come with any new mother. And more so when a pandemic is going on, there are a lot of concerns that all of you have. So here we go on to the uh, um, next slide where I'm going to be talking about uh, what is it you need to know in today's lecture is that must know on essential baby care and the frequently asked questions in baby care. So if you're new mothers, you should, uh, we all should know some basic information about uh, babies. That is an ideal weight for a newborn is around 2.5 kgs. But with better maternal nutrition, nowadays the babies are uh, almost weighing 2.8 kgs in India. And any baby born three weeks before your expected date of delivery is called a preterm. And many mothers will wonder when the baby will pass the first urine. So first urine passage by 30 hours of birth and stools by 24 hours is good enough. So it's not necessary and a baby should pass immediately urine or immediately stool. We have time about 30 hours for the urine and about 24 to 48 hours for the stool. Uh, their stools will change from dark green. At birth, they are really black. Then they change to green and later to golden yellow by about five days. Now, why is this so important is if the stool change color, color change doesn't happen, it indicates that probably the feeding is not adequate. Only when the feeding is adequate, the stool starts moving off and the color also changes. And the baby should also be passing at least six to eight times urine a day after four days of life. The first day they might pass about one to two times, but after that they definitely need to pass at least six to eight times a day. This is extremely necessary because many times mothers are not aware about this and they are happy with the child passing just one to two times urine a day. This one to two times urine a day can be because of inadequate feeding or any problems in the kidney which is not allowing the urine to come out. Most commonly, it's because of feeding issues and a good feeding has to be established in order to have a good urine output and stooling. So the next thing is how much do they breathe? So generally, they breathe about 40 to 60 times a minute. Now, how do we see breathing? When we all breathe, our chest actually comes out and goes. In. But for babies, it's different. It's only the tummy that keeps coming in and going out. So whenever you're seeing a tummy movement, which is about 40 to 60 times a minute, that means your baby is breathing normal. Suppose the baby is breathing, a newborn baby is breathing less than 20 times or more than 60 times, it means there can be some problem with his breathing related to his lungs and he will require some assistance from the medical care. The next thing to see a well-being of a baby is that he should always be pink. A pink color denotes that the baby's blood flow is good and his temperature is also good. So in the month of September, in the month of September and October, what we generally see is babies being brought cold, clammy and not moving to the house, uh, in a, not moving in the house. That's because we don't tend to cover them warm. And we see the extreme in the month of March and April, whether they are over covered and they're sweating and they have lost so much of weight and they come dehydrated. Both this should be avoided by periodically assessing the baby, which is like every time you pick up the baby to feed, which is about two to three hourly, just feel his palm and sole to make sure they're warm. If they're just warm, they should not be hot or they shouldn't be too cold. If they're just warm, then whatever you're doing is adequate for the baby. Next comes jaundice. Now we need to remember that all babies born at, in, in this world are going to have some amount of jaundice. And this jaundice is very normal, which takes about seven to 10 days and settles without problem in most of the babies. However, in special circumstances like preterms and faulty feeding, which is predominantly related to nipple problem in the mother or milk output or baby's condition is not allowing him to feed, this jaundice can get exaggerated. The other reason for jaundice in the baby is probably because of a lot of uh, blood group incompatibility, which is like, the mother is a negative blood group and baby is positive or the mother is O group and the baby is A or B. But these are not a very common uh, incidence. The most common incident is always related to faulty feeding or inadequate feeding. Newborns hardly develop fever. Uh, a baby who is born very, very rarely present their issues with fever. 
So any temperature that we document or we feel the baby is hot and we try to measure and read about 100 degrees definitely requires a medical attention. It means a serious illness and that is not a condition which can be taken care at home. Any fever in a baby should be brought to the hospital. They also should have a very spontaneous feeding habit, which means by day four, day five of life, they should automatically get up and feed. It's not that they keep on sleeping for six, seven hours and you try waking them and they're still sleepy. That is called lethargy or dull activity, which needs to be evaluated. And remember, babies are very, very dynamic. They keep moving themselves. That is from a very sleepy baby. Suddenly they become active and about three to four weeks, they become really hyperactive with a lot of feed demands. All this dynamic nature in them are very, very normal. So I'm going to say, so, uh, list out some frequently asked questions. So some of the mothers come and show us the baby and they say flathead syndrome of, or it's called positional plagiocephaly. They always say, my baby is lying only to one side. He's not turning at all. So like how we are right and left-handed, even we don't sleep with head in the center. We also try to sleep to one side or even we turn to one side. Since the babies are still not trained to turn to one side, they will positionally have their head on one side. This position may find some difference in their head shape, which is like one side is flat and one forehead is uh, ahead of the other forehead, which we call it as plagiocephaly. Now, this is nothing serious or alarming. We just have to distract the babies in such a way that they are able to see the opposite side. So keeping a sandbag, sandbag means uh, fill a bag or a pouch with some sand tight and you keep it on the side that they're always lying down. And as you keep it there, the baby starts turning to the opposite side. It will also become beneficial if you hang something bright, colorful on the opposite so that the child starts getting distracted and he sees them. So this head shape is quite normal. And even if you see these images, they're all okay. So uh, this is the way that it has to be done. Next thing is, okay. So that's, that's how we find out the shape preferring to lie one side. And the other thing that the mothers generally ask us is about the uh, soft spot on the scalp. So you will find a soft area on the scalp, which is very, very normal and present in all babies at birth. So that's because there are multiple bones that are fusing on to form the head shape. And where they are fusing, there is a small gap. As the baby grows bigger and bigger, the bones also mature and it gets close by about 18 months, 9 to 18 months, which is why till then you will have this soft spot. You can see this image on the right side, that soft spot or which in, in uh, South India they say is uchi. It's very common in all babies and we have to wait about 9 to 18 months for it to close. Many people relate to, relate to this and ask me whether tonsure can be done. Yes, tonsure can be done. Provided the person who is doing the tonsure is stable enough and experienced enough to hold the baby upright. Next thing is the cradle cap. When we see newborn babies, you might, feel, you might see the head with so much of uh, scaly lesions, which we generally relate it to as dandruff. This cradle cap is present from birth and you might obviously see it somewhere around third week of life. It is very sticky, peely, and once it falls, it also takes a flock of hair with it. But this is nothing to worry. So this flocky hair, uh, flaky substances take about six months to clear off the scalp. So till then, it's very normal for the head to have some uh, scales like this. How can we get rid of this is frequent bathing of uh, head, which is like a head bath is very needed for babies. The Indian custom is to bathe the baby uh, thrice or four times a, a week hair wash. But I would suggest when you have such scaly lesions, everyday shampoo wash would be good for it to wither away quickly so that the new hair can grow. You should not try to peel it off by your hand because that can injure the scalp and cause more bleeding. You can apply oil the previous day and the next day you can wash it and this facilitate easy removal of the scalp. They also ask about hair growth. So you will see in this picture, there is some, this is a heart shaped um, forehead and you will find some central balding. This hair fall is very common in babies around fourth to fifth month because that's when they're lying down always and there's a lot of friction on their head and there'll be some loss of hair. However, with time, they grow their 
they grow back. So you can see this type of balding on the head is very normal. They grow back and they have normal hair when they are around one year to one, one year plus because by then the strain on the head is less. They are sitting up, they're walking and the, so the hair gets the time to grow. Now eyes. Whenever we are seeing an eyes in newborn, in the initial period, we will see some discharge like on the left side. This type of discharge, it's because all of us have a connection between the eyes and the nose. That's why when we cry, we start blowing the nose. But in babies, those tracts are not really well formed in some of them. So whatever secretions are being formed in the eye, tries another, takes another tract and comes out of the eye itself. At this point, we should see whether the eyes are clear or red. If it is red, it has to be taken to the doctor to see for any inside the eye infection. But in the absence of any redness and no swelling around the neck, all you need to do is clean this discharge and keep your little finger here and massage it from up, down, up, down, up, down. Like, likewise, about 15 times, three times a day. And this discharge will settle in about three to four weeks. The image on the right is a dangerous eye because this has got some lid swelling as well as very purulent secretions and the light eyes per se has become smaller and it, we are not able to see how it is inside. These are sometimes um, can lead to serious injuries and it is always better we see the eye doctor and clarify that there is no infection and it is self limiting White spot on the eyes. This black part of the eye should always be black. Any whiteness like this is abnormal. And if you notice such white things, it can be a cataract or some other issues in the eyes, which also needs a medical intervention. So for the first eye, you do a massage. The second eye may require antibiotics. The third eye will require an evaluation for the eye part. And any no eye contact. So by two months, your baby will be making beautiful eye contact with you, responding to your call and trying to babble with some response. If there is no eye contact, then it is abnormal. Coming to the mouth, all babies drool. This is a fantastic uh, way they drool at about three to four months because that's the time they're tongue twisting and they're listening to and they want to respond. So this drooling is very common in babies. Such type of drooling should be encouraged and we should not keep wiping them again and again. We should just allow them to talk a lot. But in the event of drooling, the saliva which is drooling is very alkaline. So what it does is it may cause some color around their cheeks to change, but they will all reverse back to normal once the baby starts to handle the secretion and, and goes in for it less drooling by about seven, eight months. They don't drool so much. Then comes a white patch. So you will see sometimes babies having such white patches on the uh, tongue, which is because of either a fungus or a milk patch. So I'm showing two different types. A one which is just on the tongue, which is not flaky or curdy. It is just because the milk has always settled there and it's called milk patch. In this, you will sometimes see this whiteness and sometimes you might not. It's very dynamic. It comes and goes. So this patch is nothing to worry about. They just need cleaning of the tongue, which can be done with a, a cotton or with a finger brush uh, and a little bit of glycerin, which can be used to clean it. Whereas the one on the right is the one which is called as the fungal infection. This fungal infection is, is something, a fungus that comes predominantly in bottle fed babies, formula fed babies or mothers having breast lesions in which the fungus goes in and uh, causes trouble. This requires a proper cleaning and also applying antifungal lotion cream ointment on the tongue, on the cheek, palate and under the tongue for five days and again it gets clear. Suppose the mother's nipple or the breast is also infected with fungus, she will also require treatment. The other thing is posetting. Posetting is like this. They put their hand into the mouth and then they warm its milk. This is nothing to worry. This is just a coordinated reflux in them, which is like a baby to take his hand from the side of his body to his mouth and suck requires a lot of coordination. This is the first thing that they do after which they will start putting this hand down and trying to sit up. So positing can be encouraged and you should not be worried. When they put so much of their hand into the mouth, sometimes they gag and bring out a little bit of milk, which is curdled. And usually this will never cause a weight loss 
breathing difficulty or disturbance to the baby. They will be happy possetters. They will be having their hand in the mouth and they will also be passing a little bit of uh, milk out of their mouth, which is okay. Then comes thumb sucking. So is thumb sucking something that should be completely avoided? You should prevent the baby from doing, you should never allow the baby? No, not at all. So it's just a concept of self-soothing behavior. When the baby is bored and there's nobody around, what they do is they put their tongue into their, I mean, they put their thumb or fingers into their mouth and they keep on cajoling and consoling themselves. But you will notice the moment you go and start speaking to the baby, the baby becomes so happy, the eyes will brighten up and they start responding to us. So all they need is some adult around them who will be talking with them, all the possibilities, so that they are kept occupied. So this self-soothing behavior in them will come down when they start having more movements, which is like once they sit up, then their hand is going to become busy with catching something, holding some objects, throwing some objects, and then this will not be an issue. There can be some children who continue to thumb suck for even one to two years, but predominantly of them will stop about nine to 10 months of age. So just pushing their hand away or pulling their hand away gives them an emotional trauma. Instead, we should distract them with something more colorful to accept it on their hands, which will be better. Teething. So that's the teething that happens in babies. We wait for the teeth to come around six to eight months, but we patiently wait till about 16 months. Only if they don't come by 16 months, we send them to the dentistry to assess. So during this teething, the most common thing that the mothers come and ask us or the family come and ask us is, oh, he's got some teeth. Is he going to fall sick? Now, what is the relation between teething and falling sick? When the teething is happening, the child perceives a different feel, a feel of itch, a feel, a craving of uh, eating and chewing with the uh, teeth. So they are trying to bite everything. They are trying to bite all possible thing that comes in contact. In this way, they are exposing them to more number of dirt, germs, uh, non-edible things, which can cause a little bit of discomfort in the stomach and they may end up having some loose tools, some vomiting and occasionally fever. So this is how these two are related. Now, how do we console a teething child? You can use teethers. You can allow them to press feet. You can allow them to console themselves with their own finger. And these are the ways and they get over it. And we can also start more of coarse food, grainy food, which they will like to uh, eat at this point of time. Now, ears. Now, holding ears, ear cleaning, ear discharge, and identifying the ear pain. So how do we go about it? So there are some babies who start holding their ears. Many mothers come and tell us they are always holding their ears and they have pain. So remember one thing, if the child is holding his ears, that means he has no pain. A child who has pain will never ever touch their hand, uh, uh, ear, and they will also refrain others from touching it. So when, if they're holding their ears, it is just a milestone because that is something before bringing the hand to the mouth, they are on the process of the hand coming from their sides to the mouth, it, catches the uh, ears that is prominent and they're holding it. Now, is ear cleaning a must for babies? It's not required because all ear has something called a wax. It is a soundproof coating for the ear to prevent from very loud injuries that can, I mean, loud noise that can happen around in the surrounding. So meticulously cleaning all this wax may expose the eardrum to injury. So the ideal way of cleaning the ear would be just whatever comes outside the hole, you can clean it. But however, if you see any honey colored brown discharge, that is a normal wax. In case you see a green, yellow, dirty smelling or creamy colored secretions, then it can be a bacteria or a fungus. So that type of ear uh, discharges are there. You can clean outside and take it to a doctor to visualize what is happening inside the ear. Identifying ear pain. How do we identify the ear pain? In front of the ear, just along your cheekbone, there is a triangular area of the ear. That's called the tragus. The moment we press that, the child goes into a wincing pain. So that is the first identification of a ear pain. <coughs> In the absence of this, the ear is unlikely to be of any pain. They also ask me questions about ear piercing. <coughs> Ear piercing can be done according to your customary wish. Only thing, it has to be done with a safe hand and sterile procedure. When somebody is pricking a needle through, we are always necessary to have a very clean uh, practice done so that we don't transmit any viral diseases. 
breastfeeding and not enough milk. So what do we do about it? <coughs> Some mothers have no secretions. They have pain during feeding, bleeding from breast, long feeding hours. How to know if the milk is enough? So how do we do? Oh, I'm sorry. So no secretions. So this is experienced by many mothers in the beginning few days of uh, birth. That's because the breast is just getting accommodated to uh, provide enough secretions. So you will have a little bit of cream colored or clear milk that is coming through the breast. And that's why you will feel it's no secretion. But the moment you start latching and provided the latching is done well and you have a comfortable relaxed latching, automatically the milk will increase in the three to five days. It will become very watery. And by about eight to nine days, it will become a thick breast milk, which is used for the babies. So first day not having a secretion is universal and it just improves with time is what we have to accept. Pain during feeding is because of two things. One is the way we are latching the baby because if the latch is not right and he starts biting on the nipple, then there will be pain. Or the second thing is because the breast is over full with milk. For both this, there is only one solution. You have to stick, sit with your healthcare worker or a doctor and ask them to teach you a painless way or technique of latching the baby, which when done will become better. Now bleeding from breast. Bleeding from breast is because the baby has bitten the nipple and that's why there's bleeding. This is no contraindication for feeding. The mother can breastfeed the baby, but it should be fed in such a way that no further biting happens. This is where latching is important because once we latch the baby well, then it should be okay. Long feeding hours. Some mothers say, tell me that I'm sitting for two hours and feeding. So we should remember it is humanly impossible for the baby to be sucking for two hours. Even we cannot do that for 15 minutes in continuity. So this is because the baby is actually sleeping on the breast and he requires a proper feeding assessment. So what I generally ask the mothers are, once the baby is awake, you should not allow him to cry too much because if they are crying, we are already late into feeding. Pick the baby up and latch him well. Make sure your latch is stainless. The baby is completely turned towards you and feed the baby. For the first 15 minutes, do not allow the baby to take any long gaps. So keep stimulating him so that he drinks well and utilizes the first 15 minutes in filling his stomach. Suppose you allow him to sleep then. Every time you try to move him away, that's the time he'll strongly latch onto you and start sucking. So he's using you like a pacifier. So long feeding hours are because they are using you as a pillow rather than as a feeding source. How to know if the milk is enough? So first thing is baby will be happy. Once they're going in for feeding, you will see all the uh, hands and uh, feet of the baby clenched. They will all relax out when they start drinking. After drinking, they sleep on your breast. They spontaneously wake in two to three hours. And you will also have about six to eight wet, uh, wet diapers and soft stools and adequate weight gain. So adequate weight gain is we expect some, the, some of them to gain about 200 grams a week. And we expect them to have doubled their weight by about five months. Now, umbilicus. Umbilicus is something, a big issue in uh, our country because we save the umbilical cord for milk banking or for customary reasons that we want to put it around their neck or around the waist. So when do the cord falls off, they generally fall around five to 13 days of life. There can be some discharge, which is like the first one. This is a discharge, which is very, very common. And uh, this does not require anything. It just requires the umbilicus to be kept dry. Then there can be this sort of a discharge that is coming, which is mucoid. Nothing needs to be done for it. Then you might see some bleeding. This is because the umbilicus is trying to heal, but the dress or the diaper keeps attaching to it and it pulls it off. And that's why there's a bleeding. Any bleeding beyond 48 hours of fall needs to assess the blood clotting factor of the baby. But otherwise, this is not a problem. The third thing is an infected umbilicus. So around the umbilicus, if you see any redness like this, then this is an infection which requires antibiotics. There'll be some babies with a pouting out umbilicus like this, which is called an umbilical granuloma. And this is nothing to worry. They just, uh, it's just because the baby is growing fast, provided we have ruled out thyroid problems in the baby. This type, this type of umbilicus in the absence of thyroid issues will spontaneously go in when they are around two to somewhere around one and a half to two years of life. Feeding the baby. So when we are feeding comes to six months of feeding the baby, we can feel some 
regurgitation, some watery stools, not passing stools, and hard stools. So it's very common for the babies to spit up some food, which is because they are either too full or they want to burp it out and they're bringing it up. As long as the regurgitation is not green or yellow, it is just plain food that we have given or curdled milk. This only requires a reassurance and request the mother not to try finishing the bowl that she has prepared. Now, watery stools. Watery stools immediately after birth needs a medical evaluation because the stools cannot be watery. But at the same time, the picture on the right, which shows some beaten egg appearance, CD stools, is the normal breastfeeding stools that we see for the first three to four months. They are somewhat liquidy. They are CD, golden yellow, and this is a normal stool. Now, not passing stools. Some of the babies, they come and say that my baby has not passed stools for three, four days. So the first thing we assess is, is the baby gained weight? So if he has gained weight, that means the quantity of milk is not an issue. Then if we ask whether they are on exclusive breastfeeding. So if they're on exclusive breastfeeding, then it's common for them to pass even once in seven days. Provided during the seven days period, they do not have discomfort and they are comfortable playing their usual and also demanding for milk. But when they pass stools, you may find that it is pungent in odor and the flatulence that they pass over the first seven days when they're not passing stools can also smell different, which is okay. But when they pass at seven days, it should be soft. What does hard stool mean in babies? Hard stools can be because of formula feeding in which they become hard or improper mixture of formula stooling or thyroid problems. So whenever we are mixing formula, it's generally in a ratio of 30 ml to one scoop. When we try to make 40 and one scoop or 50 ml and one scoop, or we put 20 ml and one scoop, this sort of a imbalanced concentration can cause some difficulty in digestion and lead to hard stools. So these hard stools needs to be revisited on how they are mixing the milk, what concentration, and in the concentration being normal, then some water can be given to the baby to make the stool softer. Skin. They ask me when to bathe the baby. Now, is bathing very important? Not at all. Earlier, years ago, we were very stringent on bathing the baby first day itself. Now, we delay bathing because we understood that it's necessary for the baby to be warm. So, bath can be done once we realize that the baby has started feeding well and the weight gain is also happening. So we request our parents not to bathe in the first five days, but to keep the baby warm. They can sponge the baby. And once we know that their weight gain and feeding are well established, we request them to bathe. Now when to apply poi, uh, powder, cream, and oil? Powder actually blocks the sweat glands. And by recommendation, we don't apply any powder. Oil can be applied, and but not by rubbing it. It is a gentle application. The concept of doing a massage is not rubbing and making the baby cry. It is a gentle application and it's a bonding. Cream can also be used with an appropriate pH. There are some mothers who ask, can I use native medications like that bark of the tree, Vasambu, then um, Machaka, all these things. Well, they don't have a scientific background, but we have seen some of the babies who take these medicines regularly can have some stomach bloating. Uh, bleeding in the motion because the rock in which we rub them or the way we burn them can cause an irritation in the stomach and have problems. Now, how do you carry the baby? So baby carrying is also important. In the image, you can see that even a small baby can be made to sit on your lap, which is one of the most comfortable ways. They don't like a flat position. So the image on the left shows how comfortable they are on sitting. An image on the right shows how well you have to be inclined. Any baby who's kept in an inclination rather than flat surface and upright positions are happy babies. So being a breastfeeding week and uh, in order to uh, speak to all of you about breastfeeding and simple queries about uh, babies, we also take it an opportunity to say in case you are breastfeeding mums and you have extra milk, you can always donate breast milk, which will be useful for another baby to save. Thank you.